In today's conversation with Laura, we'll be discussing her personal philosophies around business leadership and the integration of social impact. Excuse me. Following the conversation, we'll be holding a live question and answer with Laura, and I encourage you to submit your questions throughout the event and try to use the Q&A function. I know so many of us put our questions in chat, but if you've been to a YWCA event, you know our chat gets quite busy, and so it's best to put the questions in, in the Q&A function, but I'll, of course, look at the chat. So with that, it is my pleasure to welcome Laura Ricketts. Thank you, Dory. It's a pleasure to be here. Well, thank you for joining us. We had to put that little that little picture in there for the time that we that you threw out the, the first pitch during Women's Empowerment Night and how we were there to support you. And that was such a fun time. And so I love different. those I love those images. Put a smile on my face. Seems like such a long time ago now. I know, it? I know. Well, here we are now in video form, but we could still have a good time today. So absolutely. So I have to, first of all, say congratulations to you for, for being selected as the Outstanding Leader in Business Award. But I want you to know, and I also want our audience to know that this award isn't just about being a woman in a CEO role or a senior leadership role. It is also about, yes, being a woman leader in business, but really using business as a platform to continue to create change. And so we want to say thank you for everything that you're doing and to let you know that it's not enough just to be a woman. <laughs> you have to do something in that role and you absolutely have been doing a lot. So thank you for all that you're doing and thank you for accepting our award as well. Yeah, well, thank you. It's, it's really an honor for me and a pleasure. And I, you know, I, I want to thank you. <clears throat> Excuse me, and thank you. Thanks to the uh, YWCA for all the great work that you're doing. Really essential, really vital to our community, and I uh, greatly appreciate it personally and on behalf of the Cubs. Huge thank you to you and everything you do. Well, I appreciate that, Laura. So let's get into some of the conversation that we'll have today. My goal is, you know, one, I guess one, you know, I hate to say benefit at all, but, you know, of course, us trying to make lemonade out of the lemons that COVID have absolutely provided us um, is the fact that we do get to spend some time with you and just get to know more about you and how you continue to use your work as a platform for change. So let's start about um, a little bit about the investment that you've already been making in the community. And, you know, if you talk about uh, the Cubs, you all have done so much um, to invest in the community. So how do you really strike that right balance in investment without losing what Cubs fans loved about their team and their ballpark? Yeah. Well, um, <clears throat> excuse me. We, when we went about that process, uh, we, of course, let me just step back for a second. When we purchased the team, mm -hmm. I think all of us, uh, my brothers and I, felt like this, uh, we were, were really becoming stewards of something, uh, a brand, an institution, an icon, uh, both in the field and the, and the team and what it's meant to the city and what it's meant to the league and baseball in general. And um, so, we, like, how can you own all that, right? You can't really own it. We're really stewards of that great history. And, and so with that came a lot of responsibility, a sense of responsibility to uh, preserve and, um, and uh, help continue that great history uh, going forward. And so, as you mentioned, uh, you know, it required us to put a lot of thought into the process uh, the, and all the plans and any renovations that we were make, going to make because we also wanted Wrigley Field to um, not only to, to be much more modern and up-to-date and have a lot of the amenities that uh, fans have come to expect at more modern, newer ballparks, but um, at the same time, really preserve the, the, that sense of what makes Wrigley so special. And uh, whether you like baseball or not, uh, when you walk into Wrigley Field and you see, um, it's, see like the, you know, the site of the of the the uh, bowl and the outfield and the stands and the rooftops and everything, it's a much different experience than just about any other ballpark. <clears throat> Excuse me. And so, uh, I mean, we really wanted to preserve that, and um, so we hired uh, historical architects. We uh, talked to a lot of historians of Wrigley Field. We looked at a lot of uh, images of Wrigley Field throughout the 100 years or so that it had been in existence. Uh, we actually hired some of the architects that um, the Red Sox had used 
uh, to refurbish Fenway. And we actually had a lot of conversations uh, with, the, with the owners of the Red Sox uh, and, their, and their team about how they went about their renovation project because they had a, a similar challenges and similar goals. So, um, and uh, you know, ended up being about a seven hundred million, six to seven hundred million dollar project. I'm happy to say, all privately financed. Well, for the most part, a couple of credits here and there, tax credits. But um, yeah, so we're we're incredibly proud of what we were able to do, and um, I, I've heard a lot of great feedback from fans, and um, just in terms of even the commissioner who was out here last week, mm. the the uh, league commissioner um, for one of our uh, postseason games um, said he hadn't quite. Uh, I don't know if he's been here since we basically completed the project, but just congratulating us on, you know, the, the great job that we've been able to do to really preserve that historic. And it is uh, on the registry of historic landmarks. I even think our Ivy is, uh, has some status. I think it's <laughs> maybe one of the only plants in the country that oh, has wow. some kind of historical landmark designation. So we, we, we're very, we have to be very careful with it. Um, but anyway, we're pretty pleased with how it all turned out. We've had a lot of great feedback uh, from fans for the development, the, you know, the refurbishment of the park, but then also outside the park and the surrounding area. Um, it's really a significantly different experience um, than it was a few years ago, and yet preserves all of the great things about Wrigley Field um, that people have come to love. No, I love that. And I, and I think that that just speaks to, you know, the orientation around stewardship versus ownership. That's, that's a significant difference. And, and I think there's businesses that probably do have more of the opportunity to do that and may not choose to. So I think that that says such so much around how you all chose to really um, lead with a community orientation around what that means for, for the Cubs and the, the, the fans and the stakeholders. So that's that's pretty awesome. So as we you know we were reflecting earlier around just how life has changed um, in this new world. Uh, I don't even want to say post COVID. The, this world that we're experiencing today. And as you as you think about you know the the community investments you've already made. You know we 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 sit in a time where it's just such an awakening that's happening to racial inequities. The protests. You know, seeing the responses to COVID nineteen, how have these issues um, been manifesting in your world? So, and how have you been able to address them both internally and externally for for your associates, for the community? Just want to get some perspective on what you've seen and what you all have been doing, recognizing where we are today. Yeah, well, um, I, I mean, of course, uh, this year has been just so challenging and, and mm -hmm. gut wrenching and. Um, enraging and saddening and inspiring too, right? Um, and I, I mean, it's affected me personally in terms mm -hmm. of my priorities and it's affected the Cubs as well significantly. About a year ago, or maybe a little bit more a year than a year ago, the um, chief diversity officer for Major League Baseball um, came to Chicago and I visited with her for a while and then Tom and I visited with her together. And to talk about what the league's doing, what we're doing uh, on the DEI front, what more we can be doing, um, <clears throat> excuse me, and how we can, um, you know, work together and encourage other teams, you know, what, what ownership we can take for some of those things. And that was about a year ago. Around this same time, uh, well, I would say after that conversation, just Tom and I were talking. And I said to Tom, you know, we make a lot about being the best. Mm -hmm. Whether it's the best facilities, like the best ballpark or the best clubhouse or the best offices, the best staff, the best team, the best coaches, the best league, the, being the best neighbor. So giving the most back to our community. We, we really have, we really strive. It's part of our fabric and our mission at the Cubs to really be the best in all those mm -hmm. respects. Let's also be the best with DEI. Let's mm -hmm. also make that part of our uh, leadership within the league and within professional sports and in co the corporate world, let's include that as part of our mission to be the best, to be a leader and to set the standard. And so when people look at um, the Cubs um, and, and see what we're doing, that will be recognized for that as well. Mm -hmm. Or when they're talking about their own um, activities and their own, what they can be doing, that they say, Hey, go look at the Cubs. Let's look at what the Cubs did because boy, they've done it right. And, um, and at that same time, we were going through an organization-wide uh, sort of refresh of our values. Mm 
Mm -hmm. and which included, you know, all of our associates and so forth. And I was um, so proud that out of that conversation, um, uh, like I said, an organization wide um, uh, exercise, that what came out of that among the many things that came out of that were values of inclusiveness and, and equity and appreciating differences. And in fact, not tolerating them, but embracing them and understanding that that makes us stronger. And, um, and so I, I was really proud of that. And so all of that was kind of swirling. Um, and then, you know, COVID came along and um, everything kind of was put on hold, largely, mm -hmm. uh, including baseball, including just playing baseball. <clears throat> Excuse me. And so, and then we saw bubbling up through all of that uh, or, or a lot of a lot of the the racial um, I don't I don't even know how to describe it because it's 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 um, I think for some it's uh, an awakening to the inequities I think for some it's um, uh, they've been aware of it for a long time maybe some people have been somewhat aware of it and now they're all the more aware of it but um, so which largely have been incredibly painful um, and. And it's a reckoning. It's, it's been a reckoning, I think, for um, a lot of individuals. But it's a reckoning for corporate America, too. And, um, and, a, and an opportunity to have another look and, um, and make change. I think we all, um, <clears throat> excuse me, have realized that this is an issue that we all, it's on all of us every mm -hmm. single one of us. And now corporations are citizens too now, according to the Supreme Court, right? And so with citizenship comes responsibility. And um, so I think it's, uh, it's on us as individuals and on us as corporations and organizations to step up and take that on and take ownership for really addressing those issues. And addressing them in a way, I know at the Cubs, we've been when trying to address them in a way that it is really woven through the fabric of our organization, which it should be, right? So um, I've seen this as sort of an opportunity um, that to force this on to the at the top of our agenda, right? And uh, let's run while we have the ball. Let's move. Let's while we have people paying attention to this more so than they maybe ever have, or certain people more so than they ever have. Um, and, and having a desire to do that, just what I'm talking about, step up and, mm -hmm. and take ownership for the, the issue. And, and a lot of people are saying, how do I do that? What do I do to help? Mm -hmm. um, and um, so at the Cubs, we've formed, um, we've, we've taken it a step further, whatever practices that we've had in the past, and we've formed um, a DEI council. Um, of, among our associates to, um, I mean, we, to help look at some of the things that we can be doing to capture the associate experience um, at the Cubs and um, to um, offer, you know, a, a more organic uh, advice to us, like organic meaning like within the organization. And we, we've also hired consultants and, um, you know, obviously the league has had initiatives um, and so forth, but, um, I think that, you know, out of that has come, um, we, we've been able to get together. The first gathering that we've had of all of our associates was socially distanced at a, at a, before a game outside, but it was a rally um, to end racism and mm -hmm. to, um, to give our associates a, a chance to get together in a safe way, but to feel like they're doing something and to understand that we're going to do this together. We're all in this together. Mm -hmm. And um, that this is a priority for our organization. And we understand it's a priority for our associates. And um, we're going to be continuing to do things that, um, um, that are, I would say, some more of events outside the organization. Um, like, for example, we're trying to organize voter registration on the south and west sides and, and organize volunteers to help with that now. But also just in the way that our, our organization operates um, at its very core. And it's, um, you know, obviously we've, our, our revenue this year 
is significantly different than in years past. And it's a challenge. It's a challenge as it is for everybody, right? Um, but um, and so some of the things that we had been talking about doing more of, um, it's a bit of more of a challenge. Like we're not hiring anybody, right? Mm-hmm. We're not making new hires. We have programs for um, internships and so forth that we're not able to do. Um, and at this time, we'll bring them back another time. But there are a lot of other things that we can be doing that don't, don't cost money. For example, look at just the law, the law firms that we, you know, uh, that we use, the accounting firms that we use. These could be Black-owned businesses. These could be, or even if we're using, continuing to use our, our current providers, we can ask for diversity on our, the teams that serve us. We can demand it. You know, and those are some of the things that, um, that we've talked about. But it's, um, I know everyone's talking about those types of things, but it, this is really a time, it's an opportunity for us, all of us, I- including corporate America, to really step up and take ownership and take action. And um, so while it's been a really challenging year, a really painful year, I, I believe a lot of good will come out of this. Um, I think we'll make some advances, some significant advances, um, but only if all of us do that, right? No, I appreciate that, Laura. And I think that, um, again, I think that what you said just really speaks to why you're getting this award, <laughs> because as a business leader, you recognize that you do have an opportunity to create change. And actually, not just any business leader, right? I do think um, being in the business of sports, that sports has just such a unique way of, with all the different stakeholders, influence points, that you can influence businesses, you can influence you know, your fans. It's just such a great way that, that sports can bridge the gap in so many ways. Um, and and you seem to really lean into that. And so I so appreciate you. First of all, I appreciate that you use a football analogy, even though you're on a baseball team. That was really cute. <laughs> so, yeah, so I realized that. Diversified in your love of sport, which is good. Um, but but also, I, I do just appreciate that you're really leaning into um, particularly the racial justice side, but want to also ask a a little more about the COVID piece, because I know that you all have been very active as well um, in in helping people access food and things like that. Can you speak on some of the things that you've all been involved in there too? Yeah, sure. Well, at the beginning um, in March, you know, when everything shut down, including baseball shut down, it was very Mm -hmm. uncertain what would happen for a long time in baseball for months. Um, we uh, are going to use that word of the year, as you call it, pivoted. Mm-hmm. Uh, we pivoted a bit and tried to really use our resources to help a city in crisis, right? We, I mean, um, at all levels. And to really figure out, okay, we can't have baseball games, but how can we use this park? How can we use the Cubs, the Cubs brand? How can we use uh, all of our resources to help the city get through this, mm-hmm. um, whether it's um, you know, at the macro level or at the micro level. Um, a lot of the businesses that we've, uh, that we have in our, for example, around Wrigley Field, um, their business was severely cut back. And so to think about, okay, can we provide meals to people like first responders mm-hmm. and uh, give business to some of these, um, you know, local businesses that are having trouble keeping their people employed, right? So thinking along those lines um, and then also supporting um, you know, all of our nurses and all of our doctors and all of our first responders that um, really put like in a, in a shockingly way and shocking way put on the front line without proper protection. Um, and um, we were able to help make some connections with regard to um, helping to provide that the PPE for, for um, uh, hospitals, especially on the west side, in the south mm-hmm. side, underserved communities. But then also, I don't know how many meals, uh, Alicia Gonzalez, who is the head of our Cubs Chairs, I don't know how many meals she personally delivered to hospitals. Like every day, it felt like we were doing something for, um, you know, hospitals. But we tried to focus on, uh, and clinics and so forth, on the south and west sides, areas that are, you know, were traditionally underserved and underserved in terms of the attention and the love that they were getting, um, you know, during um, their response to the COVID crisis too. But then also helping with um, uh, programs that the city was running, the state, making contributions to those. Um, I think we've been in, in, um, um, you know, 
helping with uh, the public schools, support for them. Uh, they all had to convert, you know, to a different way of learning uh, without the resources that they needed to have. And so uh, thinking through how can we support public schools, which we already do to a, a great degree, we support, support all the public schools in the city of Chicago. But this was like a different way. How can we be helpful to them and how can we be supportive of them? Um, and then also, too, we have our own programs at Cubs Charities. We also um, support a number of organizations throughout the city. Um, we're proud of the fact that we're active in all the neighborhoods throughout the city. Mm -hmm. We're not just around Wrigleyville. We, and we, we make a point of that. We're very proud of that, um, that we're a Chicago team and we're a Chicago mm -hmm. organization and not just a North Side uh, team or a North Side organization. So, um, but really with, with our grants that we, we make every year um, to, uh, first of all, make them immediately and not wait, not wait until our grant launch or what have you. And then also uh, increase all of them by 10%. Oh, wow. And then also remove any restrictions that we originally had, had so that organizations can really have the, the freedom and the flexibility to use those funds, um, you know, as, uh, as they see fit, as they might, have to in the changing landscape of everything that's going on. I, you know, one of the things that I'm, I'm most proud of, um, in addition to all of that, uh, we were able to use the ballpark as sort of a, a huge pop-up food pantry and to partner, with, yeah, to partner with Lakeview Pantry um, to use the, you know, Wrigley Field and all of our facilities there to help uh, them scale up significantly. I think the demand for their services went up like 400% or something like that. And they were serving not just Lakeview, they were serving communities on the West side and the South side as well. And trying to help um, pick up some of that need as well. And um, just the, the numbers of people that they were trying to serve, they couldn't continue to do it in a socially distanced way in the facilities that they had. So to help them meet their overwhelming demand. Um, and it was just uh, something that we're, we're all just so proud of that we were able to facilitate that great work to be sort of a, a small uh, support, play a small supporting role in the great work that they were doing. And um, I personally got to spend some time, you know, moving boxes and uh, packing stuff up and getting them from one place to the other and emptying, you know, emptying out crates of uh, food from various donors and so forth. Um, and we were able to do that for a long time um, mm -hmm. until you know, until we had to shut things down because we were actually going to play some baseball in the park. So, <laughs> well, um, so that, that is such great examples though, Lauren. So I, literally I got chills um, thinking just about how you were able to, to leverage the resources of the Cubs to just in, in, impact the community at such a great extent. That is, that is so huge. Well, it was, you know, it was really, a feel good for us because we, you know, everyone, the city was in a crisis. Right. Right. And to a large extent we still are. Right. Um, mm -hmm. Just to a degree, but it was also new and everyone was like, how can I help? Everyone mm -hmm. was wondering, what can we do? How can we help? So it was um, sort of, I want to say personally therapeutic mm -hmm. <laughs> to be able to be doing some of those things and know that we're, we're doing something. We're, we're trying to, to be responsive and um, help our community on a number of different levels and help the first responders and the nurses and the doctors. And we actually, uh, we were reached by uh, UIC reached out to us because at the beginning, because they were having issues with um, people dying in yeah. isolation by themselves. Mm -hmm. And then also people not, not with COVID, but people having babies who mm -hmm. couldn't, you know, things like that, who couldn't have, you know, family members coming to visit or, you know, just how it, it would affect other patients in the hospital, but mostly people dying uh, alone and um, how just awful that is and, and, and scary that is. And so we were able to provide a number of iPads um, to their COVID unit to help, uh, you know, to provide to people so they could, you know, be with their loved ones um, while they were sick. And, um, you know, in the event that, you know, the tragedy of, well, that they would lose their life, that they could keep that connection with their family members. Because what, what an awful way to, you know, to be, have a, 
you know, this scary new virus that none of us really knew a lot about. We're still learning every day, right? Yeah. But then also to, to be facing that and then also, um, you know, for many people to, you know, pass away from that, um, to not have to do it alone. Yeah. Um, those were like, you know, just really concrete things that we were able to do that um, I would argue helped us get through it. Right. Sure. And Laura, I should, I should tell you that I cry at everything and I'm just like, Oh, that's so horrible. I'm so glad. You're about to make me cry. (laughs) (laughs) I'm like, Oh, I cry at everything. That's why they don't let me out with clients or do the work. They're just like, stay in the office because I'll be like, Oh my God. (laughs) I cry at everything. So my, so, so for those in the audience that are new to me crying, I cry at everything. That's why they keep, they try, that's why they try to keep me away from our clients and everything else because my heart can't handle too much. So, but, <laughs> but, uh, but part of your, you know, one of the things that makes you so, so great, which is another reason where we want to just highlight so much of what you're doing is that not only are you the co-owner of the Cubs, but you're also the, um, the, the chairperson of the board for Cubs Charities. And so you mentioned Alicia Gonzalez, who we just adore and such a, a great partner for us. But what, you know, you've mentioned so many things that you all have already done, but wanted to see if there was anything else you want to highlight that, you know, you, you, you've already made the point that the, that Cubs, that the Chicago Cubs is Chicago, a Chicago team, not just the, the, the North side team and all of that. So would love to hear more about what you are proud of and the impact that you've had in the neighborhoods that you've been doing all along, even before COVID, even before you made me start crying up in here. So, <laughs> well, I should tell you that I have trouble looking at somebody who's crying and not crying myself. So <laughs> let's be careful. This doesn't okay, have to let's, let's let's do some crying. Yeah. <laughs> um, well, first of all, I want to step back and say you're giving me a lot of credit for things that other people are doing at the Cubs as well. Um, you know, like you mentioned, Alicia, just we have an amazing staff um, at the Cubs, both in Cubs charities and working for the Cubs. And um, so I can't take credit for um, everything that we're doing because, um, you know, obviously because uh, the role that they play and they all make, they all make me look good. Um, so, uh, which I'm very appreciative for. Um, you know, and speaking of, of Cubs charities and how we, we've it's evolved since my family took over ownership about 10 years ago. And one of the things that has evolved is that we, we used to do primarily grant making. And now we've, we've developed some of our own programming, which I'm really proud of. And most recently, um, we've developed uh, coaching, sort of trauma-based coaching with, uh, you know, youth um, – uh, sports-based youth, youth development, which I always have trouble saying, um, sports-based youth development. Um, and in, in that we have, uh, we train coaches to coach children, not just in baseball or softball, which by the way, I'm always, I'm always making sure any programs that we have or that we support are also supporting girls playing softball or young women playing softball and not just men. I know some, some of the people that comes probably get, yes, Laura, women are, we are serving girls. We're all serving men. I was a softball player myself growing up, an all-star, I will say. The only all-star in our family. But, um, um, but to, uh, to take coaching to another level um, and uh, sort of the social-emotional learning aspect of that. And we've worked with other partners um, to help develop how to coach coaches. Oh, so the parents that are stepping up to coach, how to coach them um, uh, to coach these children who need so much more than just instruction on how to play baseball, right, or play softball. Um, and that's something that I'm really proud of that we've done uh, over the past few years. And I, I feel like we're just at the tip of the iceberg with what we could be doing with that. Um, so we just have great staff at Cubs Charities. And it's just been, uh, you know, um, they're doing great things and it's a joy. It's, it's one of the, the great things about, like I said, stewardship of this, mm-hmm. of this organization, this, you know, this facility, this um, iconic sports institution is the ability to leverage that um, to give back to your community. And that's, that's just, it's such a joy and a reward, huge reward um, to be able to do that. No, that's great. And I, um, I have to having the being in a, in a a nonprofit role and recognizing the board. The board does 
make a difference. So I know the folks are doing the work, but the, the leadership that support that work also matters. So you're not getting out of the credit to you, Laura. So thank you. <laughs> I know you're trying, but you can't get out of that credit too. <laughs> So, so let's talk a little bit about the business side of things. And so you've mentioned so much of the investment that um, has happened to, to really uh, develop and uh, invest, yes, in the community, but invest in the, in the, in the business to, to make it um, such a, a great uh, resource and of the community. So, but we know that, you know, Wrigley Field, you put a lot of investment, the hotel and the retail. Um, but what we people may not know is that a lot of this, all of this was constructed by union labor and included many opportunities for women and minorities. And so I'd love to, to hear you, you know, talk about what you've been doing there um, from a business side as well. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so with regard to the projects that you're mentioning specifically, uh, about a hundred million dollars worth of those contracts were uh, awarded to, um, women owned businesses or, uh, you know, businesses owned by people of color. And we're very, very proud of that. And then also uh, approximately 38% of the work that was done of the work hours were by women and people of color. So, um, yeah, and that, I don't, I don't think any of that was necessarily required of us, but mm-hmm. it was something that was important to us to be able to do, um, as a, Particularly, you know, as you mentioned, it's private financing. So I'm almost positive it wasn't required. So yeah, yeah. right. And I will say, I will say too, the private financing, I have to uh, thank our equity investors because they played a huge role. We, we went out and uh, when it became apparent, there really wasn't going to be significant public financing for this. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, we went out and, and looked for uh, investors that would be able to put up money so that we could afford to do this. Um, but um, it's also, you know, like I, I mentioned before, day to day, we try to, um, um, you know, with regard to the vendors that we use and everything that we, all of our operations, mm-hmm. um, we've been fairly mindful. And, I, and now we're at a, a point where we're just all the more so, right? And really trying to incorporate that even more into the fabric of our organization. No, that's great. And I really want to highlight that because again, you know, not to sound like a broken record, but you know, as we look for folks and look for models and examples, we recognize that you all have really continued to create this ripple effect with the, the approach that you're taking to business. And $100 million is nothing to sneeze at, right? So um, knowing that that much money got infused into women and um, minority-owned business is quite significant. And as you mentioned as well, even on the employment side and the workers themselves also being women of people of color, that, that's what we're talking about when we want to see you know, marketplace driven impact. That's what we're talking about. Like we couldn't replicate that (laughs) as a human services organization if we tried. And so the fact that you could leverage your platform to do that is, is so significant. Um, I have, I see the questions are, are rolling in. And so, um, but before I get that, I got one more question before we get to some of the, the audience questions here, but Laura just wanted to sort of hear, um, you know, a little more about your personal reflection. And, you know, we've talked about so many of the things that you've done, but I want to hear sort of what has influenced you to sort of be the way you are, to recognize all these connection points as you're doing this business, as you're, you're participating in community, what's really influenced you to, to do the things that you've done the way you've done them? Yeah. Well, I'm a woman and I'm a queer woman. And that influences my mm-hmm. life. It, it, it's the, what, the shoes I walk in in this world, right? And it's the experience that I have of the world. So um, I think, you know, I grew up in a very male-dominated household, three brothers and a father with a very big personality. And um, that influenced me a lot in terms of, uh, you know, uh, what you need to do to stand up for yourself and to right. communicate and um, – and then um, when I was in law school, you know, most law school classes are pretty evenly women to men nowadays. Some of them are more women than men. But I, had, I was at Michigan Law School and I had a section. They divide their class into sections. And for some reason, my section had a lot more men than women. Mm-hmm. And you could feel it. First of all, the, the nature of law school, the Socratic method, how they teach the law is, I would argue, a very aggressive way of teaching <laughs> and uh, probably a little bit more uh, you know, suited to men than women. But um, in any event, just feeling uh, in the classroom, 
the uh, the you know the the male students shooting up their hands to answer questions, the women not speaking up, and almost feeling like muzzled. You know, almost feel like I, I didn't have a voice. I'm like, why are other women speaking up? And then a fear of myself speaking up that I might be wrong mm. or, uh, you know, or just made to look, you know, like I didn't know what I was talking about. Yeah. Uh, what came out of that is um, all the other women were feeling the same way. And so we organized, like we are going to form a study group and any woman that wants to, to belong to it can be a part of it. And we're going to encourage each other to speak up every day. We are going to encourage each other to speak up in class. There's not going to be a class where women don't speak a uh, one woman at least speaks up. And then after they speak up, we're going to say, great comment. Good job. You know, well done, <laughs> you know? Um, and you know, and that was like so, simple things like that made a big difference. Right. But it was just palpable in the atmosphere of, of a classroom. And it just, it didn't feel right to me. And, and, um, I had had those feelings before, obviously, but it was really overwhelming in, in that law school setting. Mm -hmm. And I think that um, it made me, you know, much more aware and opened my eyes. And then mm -hmm. I didn't come out until after law school. And um, well, first of all, let me step back a little bit. Then working in a law firm after mm -hmm. law school, mm -hmm. and I was I did corporate and securities work, and I had uh, wanted to do venture capital work. This was the late '90s. And I asked our partner, uh, the, the senior partner that was doing venture capital work, I said, hey, I, I, we went to lunch. And I said, I want to I join your group. Uh, it's really interesting what you're doing. Uh, and then he, he said, well, you know, Laura, it's mostly men doing this. Mm. And I'm like, yeah, I get it. It's mostly men at this law firm. It's mostly men in this corporate practice group. Mostly men in my law school class. Mostly men in my major of philosophy uh, in college. Mostly men in my family. I think I can handle it. <laughs> well, you should know. We use a lot of cuss words. And I was like, damn it, I can, that doesn't bother me at all. You know, I can, I can keep up on that. It's not going to offend me. I've, I've heard a few over the years. And then finally he said, well, I don't know. You know, we use a lot of sports analogies. And, um, of course, I had grown up, you know, following all sorts of sports, playing all sorts of sports myself when I was young. I was in a sport all year round. And, um, you know, of course, with three brothers and mm -hmm. I still to this day use a lot of sports analogies and um, I just had to laugh. And then, of course, years later when my family, I think, you know, 12 years later, what have you, when our, my family bought the Cubs, it's just the irony of that. Um, but um, it's just how that kind of mindset, you know, sure. experiencing that personally, but then also, I, I mean, so being, a, that's from, you know, being a woman and incident is, that's one small incident, right? There are women have that all the time everywhere. And, um, and, you know, I was in a very privileged environment, a law firm, a law school, right? Mm -hmm. um, it's, I think as you have your woman in a less privileged position, it's all the more so, right? Yeah. So, um, but also I think, you know, being, gay um, has also significantly impacted that because of um, when I came out after law school, just the more um, uh, obvious and overt discrimination. And um, it helped, it really helped me wake up. It was really mm. a gift, really, to, to, to see things on a certain level and then to uh, experience it on another level um, more personally, and then you can begin to understand what it might be like to walk in someone else's shoes who has to deal with that even more so, right? Mm -hmm. And I remember one time I was volunteering for Lambda Legal, trying to get more women engaged sure, with sure. Lambda Legal, because if you go to like a fundraiser for LGBT causes, oftentimes you, if you're a woman, you'll be, you know, one of five in a room of a hundred men or whatever. Um, it's better, a little bit better now, but, um, so I was trying, I was organizing women's events uh, on a volunteer basis and trying to get more women engaged. And I made a poster uh, for this event that we we're having for women. And the regional director uh, shot me an email back and said, that's great. Can you add more color to the images that you, the stock photos that you used? And I'm like, yeah, well, I'm, I'm, I don't know what you mean. You need more, more purple or you want like, you know, I didn't understand what she was saying. And then she's like, no, people of color. That's what we want. We need to show more diversity. And um, I'm like, oh, of course, of course. That's, um, that's just kind of a small, silly example, but um, 
you know, one of the ways that coming out Mm -hmm. um, opened my eyes to a number of things, uh, just personally in my experience in the world, but then helping to understand um, that if you're not white, male, um, and among other things, then you have a very different experience in this world. And we share that commonality, right? Mm -hmm. We all share it. It's not about LGBTQ rights. And it's not about women's rights. And it's not about just equity for uh, people of color. It's about all of us. It's about how we think of ourselves collectively and individually as well. But to me, it it gave me a much greater sense of, um, um, I don't know, I don't don't know quite the word is if it's kinship or Mm. um, feeling like I can never understand what it's like to walk in the shoes of a black woman. Sure. Um, but I can understand at least that I can't fully understand that, right? Mm-hmm. And I can have some sense of that. That awareness, um, yeah. Yeah, and it's not just because I'm gay or because I'm a woman, uh, but it. But those experiences kind of help me, you know, um, understand it a little bit better, I think, and have a greater sensitivity to those things. And then also because of that, and because I am a white woman, and I am a white woman of privilege, um, not in many, I mean that in many different respects. Sure, sure. Um, that there, because of that, I have a responsibility mm-hmm. uh, to uh, address those things, you know, and speak up. Um, so, you know, it's um, really through personal experience and, um, you know, I would say being, so being queer and coming out while it's challenging and difficult. And um, at the time I did, it wasn't quite as easy as it might be today. And it's still not easy for a lot of people. Sure, sure. Um, It depends where you are in the country. And now um, just this week, we had a couple of Supreme Court justices opine unnecessarily about whether or not my marriage is valid, uh, whether we should revisit that. Well, it's five years down the road and we have a couple kids. We own a house together. We file taxes together. Kind of late to say maybe you're going to take that back, right? Mm. But um, even to this day, all of us are at risk. But it gives you, um, it's given me a greater sense of what that means for uh, people in, who walk in different shoes but have a similar, perhaps, experience. Well, yeah, Laura, I should have started there because we could have had a whole conversation about this. <laughs> just oh, yeah. Those topics along. But I, but I will get to the questions in the comments, but I have a couple more questions just based on what you said. One, you know, recognizing that you're a women, woman lawyer and recognizing that we j- you just mentioned the Supreme Court. RBG, your thoughts on what oh. she meant to you as Painful. a woman lawyer. Yeah. Um, just, I have to, I just have to ask you. Well, it's, it's painful It's mm-hmm. uh, to see her go. I mean, no, there's no woman in this country that hasn't benefited from her courage, her um, determination, um, the, just her, the, her work, her life's work. And um, I, when I, the day she died, I went to a game at um, Wrigley, and I have to be very careful where I sit, and you know, I have to wear a mask because we have all these rules. And, of course, the ballpark is empty. Um, I'm sitting by myself, I think it was a Friday night at a baseball game in a dark owner suite, and I think I cried most of the game, mm-hmm. <laughs> because texting friends and, yeah. you know, talking to friends, I'm just like, why am I even here, you know, yeah. why am I even yeah. here, um, I probably shouldn't have come tonight, but. I'm but glad just, I didn't see you, because I would have been crying some more too, so. I know, right, <laughs> I know, my friends and I are texting each other back and forth, and we're making each other cry, but um, just, what it's the impact that she's had, the significance, she's, um, she's not like any other Supreme Court justice. And we're seeing that, you know, with, um, uh, with, with all the tributes to her. And um, so um, it's like an earthquake. Mm. And I think for me, and I know for many other people, it just means uh, feeling like like some of that weight uh, that she carried is on us. Mm. No, I, I appreciate that. And I actually, well, because one of the questions I had actually blends into one of the questions in the Q&A. So, but, you know, to, of course, to the degree of your comfort, um, how do you navigate some of your political advocacy and interest um, with your activities and your role in a very public business? How do you navigate all of that? 
It's a really good question because um, I think we all need to be our authentic selves Mm -hmm. everywhere we go. And um, for a long time, I tried to parse that a little bit because people come to a baseball game, if you're you're talking about the Cubs, people Mm -hmm. come to a baseball game to kind of relax and get away from some of those things. Or they focus on baseball as a a fun distraction. Um, It's entertainment. Uh, It's something that um, is a break from um, everything else going on, right? And um, I think for a long time, I was a little bit more restrained Mm -hmm. um, in terms of expressing my views um, Mm -hmm. because of that um, sensitivity, really. And, um, but we all have to be our authentic selves. And to go back to Ruth Bader Ginsburg, uh, how you say something um, is important, is what you, almost important is what you say, right? She always just mm-hmm. say, if you want to lead, then you have to lead in a way that'll bring people along. And, um, but also another, you know, back to Ruth Bader Ginsburg, just her appreciation for civility and that you can, you can have differences of opinion with people on matters very important to you and, and still care about them and still consider them friends. And um, you don't have to be enemies, right? Mm-hmm. Um, you don't have to hate each other. We need more of that right now, obviously, in all of our politics and all of that we're doing. Um, we need a bit more of that to have that appreciation for differences in that respect as well. Um, but um, I try not to, you know, I try to keep somewhat of a, of a line there, but we all have to be ourselves. We have to show up 100% ourselves every day, everywhere we go. You can't, you can't, you know, live an authentic life and kind of mute it down for, you know, in some circumstances, but, but at the same time, be respectful of, it, of differences. Sure, no, I appreciate that. Uh, so a couple other questions that, that's in our, our, our Q&A. So how do you help your children understand your value set and philanthropic priorities? And can you share your thoughts on how you make your own philanthropic decisions? Um, well, I have to, lately I've tried to be more mindful about mm-hmm. what's really important to me personally. You're, this is a question about me personally. Yeah. Um, I think that uh, it's, it's an interesting question because both my wife and I, even before this pandemic came and we had sort of all these um, racial issues that were kind of bubbling more predominantly to the front of our sort of collective consciousness. Mm -hmm. um, We had been kind of questioning where we're concentrating our, our energy, our resources, Mm -hmm. and what, where our passions really lie. Um, And I think this year is only, um, you know, added more weight to that and more, um, you know, um, kind of factored into all of that deliberation. Um, but I um, largely am interested in supporting girls, women, access, equality, uh, people of color, uh, of course, LGBT community. Those are the things that are important to me um, and that I largely spend my time supporting, um, especially um, there are a number of political um, organizations that support, you know, access and voting and things like that. Thank you. So in terms of, you know, you've described a lot about clearly what the Cubs are doing. Um, so my board chair, hey, Joyce Winicky, I see your question. I'm going to make sure I answer that <laughs> or ask that, I should say. But what do you see happening across the, the MLB in terms of social impact as well? Mm-hmm. Uh, well, the leaks become uh, a lot more... I have to say, none of us have done as much as we could be doing up to this point, right? But I've actually been quite proud of the league and some of the things that that they've taken the initiative on. Um, There's always more that can be done. But I think, I mean, you've heard, you've seen over the past few months, I know maybe you haven't been paying attention, but the league has definitely had a a much uh, greater awareness on Mm -hmm. some of these issues and um, taken, um, you know, taken some steps and made some stands on um, uh, sort of league wide. And then I think, you know, really it's on every team as well to do some of this stuff. Um, and, I, and I'm, um, 
we can always be doing more. Let's put it that way. We can always be doing more. It's not that there haven't been efforts, but um, all of us can be doing a bit better job. Sure. So to that point, Laura, there's a question in, um, from the audience that, that asks, how, did, how would you describe your personal leadership values? Well, that's a big question for, uh, you know, for, <laughs> for the tail end of this conversation. Yeah, I know. How would I describe my personal got back leadership to that value? Last, so. Sorry, go ahead, Laura. Uh, I'm sorry. No, no, I, it's just uh, my personal leadership values. I'm, I guess they would be my personal values mm -hmm. uh, and leading while embracing those personal values. It's, it's funny to think about leadership. Um, and people have said to me, oh, well, how significant is you're the first out queer owner of a baseball team? Mm -hmm. And I'm like, well, didn't really have a choice in that. Um, <laughs> I was out and my family bought a baseball team. So, um, you know, or, you know, what do you, how do you think about your position in this, um, in this role in a male dominated sport? And again, I'm like, you have to understand, like, it, it was kind of, it kind of happened into this. Okay. It right, wasn't right. my lifelong dream. Um, and so, um, given that that doesn't take away at all from my appreciation of the unique position that I'm in and what I can be doing. Mm -hmm. And it, uh, you know, we talked about stewardship earlier. Mm -hmm. It gives, I, I feel like it gives me an even greater sense of um, you're in, in this amazing position. So what are you going to do with it? Mm. You know, are you going to, um, are you going to use it for good? Um, you know, I keep, I always go back to uh, this notion of to whom much is given, much is expected. And um, with every uh, privilege, there's also responsibility and mm -hmm. that we have to uh, keep that in mind that we're not given these opportunities or these gifts solely for ourselves, but for everybody. And that we, you know, the more that we all can think that way, I think that's kind of, you know, a key to unlocking some of the issues that we have um, in our country now. So, Laura, this has been such an incredible conversation. I so appreciate you um, taking time with us, allowing us to hear more, see you more, and understand well, for those who, who didn't understand beforehand, I know they understand now and then, and actually people knew beforehand why we selected you as our recipient of the, the business award for this year's Leader Luncheon, which of course we're pivoting to as well. The, the final sort of question I have before um, the team takes over that I, I, I reflect on the theme of Leader Luncheon, which is power, progress, and possibility, or excuse me, progress, power and possibilities. The marketing team is kicking me right now for that, for not saying that correctly. But, you know, we say a lot that we, we recognize that we do sit in a, such a position of power to really shape the, hundred, the next hundred years uh, for women and people of color, those who've been more marginalized. So leaning into that theme, I would love to hear from you what you believe is possible as we sit here today for the next hundred years and what would you like to see the world become? That is another really big question. <laughs> we did the I mean, whole thing backwards, Laura. We did the whole thing backwards. <laughs> I mean, yeah, the sky's the limit. Uh, no, I mean, look where we've come in the hundred years since uh, oh, women earned the right to vote. Look where women of color have come. We got to do this faster, folks. We got mm -hmm. we got to have a better a better pace, right? We've got to pick up the pace. I think we have an opportunity to kind of to do that now. Um, what I would like to see, I I would like to see more women in positions of power, whether it's corporate or political, we have to have more women elected officials. Um, that's my bias. We have to have more women of color. I'm, I'm granting everyone that's my bias. We have to have more women of color um, because I think it's a big change in how in office. More women that have children in office. More women that have children in work. Um, because I think we need that perspective to, um, for our government and to, to help heal, to move us forward, to be reflective of uh, our diverse population. Um, and um, so what's possible? Um, 
It's a good question. But um, I hope more so than it's happened in the last hundred years. Mm. Absolutely. We have to do better. Oh, I appreciate that. So I, I kind of have one more. I can't, I can't help but notice in your background there. So I got to ask you, what, what are your thoughts about the general election? Real quick before they cut me off. No. Well, being my authentic self, I will tell you, I'm on the finance committee for uh, Biden-Harris. And, um, uh, and, um, so I'm actively engaged in that. I'm not, I don't hide what, how I think the election, I hope the election will come out. I've been working very hard to, um, you know, uh, to have an impact on that, but not just that. I mean, I'm on the board of Emily's list. We're trying to get more women elected to the Senate sure. more democratic pro-choice women elected to the Senate. Um, we have some amazing candidates. I'm, um, on the board of LPAC, um, which is, uh, a pact formed uh, by and for queer women. Um, and we have a number of amazing candidates. We're trying to double the number of, of queer women in, in um, the house this year. Um, so um, yeah, I, I, I said, I don't try to overwhelm people with my, uh, you know, sort of politicals, uh, but you know, I can refer to it here and uh and i do want to be my authentic self so well i appreciate all of your authenticity and what you bring to business and what you're bringing uh just to our country period and everything that you're doing so thank you laura for for spending time with us today we look forward to to honoring you and recognizing you at the leader luncheon and with that i will turn it over to crystal to to roll our fi final slide so thank you so much thank laura. you Lori. thanks for everything you're doing. you're doing oh same here